Hello, everyone. You're all very welcome to this event, which is taking place as part of a programme of events to mark the St. Patrick's Mental Health Services 2022 Recovery Festival. Now, this webinar is very special in that it's been devised and developed by our Service Users and Supporters Council, who we'll chat about more later this morning. Today, we're going to explore a number of topics, really, including the vital roles that family members and supporters can play in someone's recovery journey, some of the barriers maybe that can prevent or limit family involvement, and the family's perspective on mental health recovery, as well as a personal account of what it's like for someone experiencing a mental health difficulty to have a family member involved in their recovery. I'd like to welcome our speakers today, Professor Paul Fearon, Medical Director at St. Patrick's, Linda Curran, Social Worker at St. Patrick's, Gary Kiernan, a former service user and member of the St. Patrick's Service Users and Supporters Council, and Siobhan Fitzharris, our service user engagement lead at St. Patrick's. Now, before we continue, I'd just like to mention that Sushil Teji was due to participate in today's event, and unfortunately, he's unable to attend due to a bereavement. So just to say, we send our sympathies and thoughts out to him, and thanks to Gary for stepping in to share his experience with us this morning. A wee bit of housekeeping before we start. It's always great to get your questions when we have events like this. So if you can submit them as they occur to you throughout the event in the little Q&A box, you'll see the function there on your screens. And we'll try to get through as many of them as we can at the end of today's session. And some of our speakers may also get back to you directly in the question box if it's a simple kind of yes or no uh, question and answer. For anyone joining us with accessibility requirements, you can turn on closed captions by clicking on the live transcript function in your Zoom window as well. And with that, let's begin. So today's first speaker is Professor Paul Fearon, who will be discussing the role of family members and supporters in the recovery journey. Now, Paul, I'm conscious you're under time pressure. So if you have a question for Paul, please ask it during the presentation and we can go through them at the end of the presentation. So over to you, Paul. Good morning. Good morning, Jan. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm delighted and, and, and I'd like to thank uh, you for inviting me to this, uh, I think, very important webinar um, on CARES. And I'm really glad we have this, uh, this actual session. My apologies in advance that I can't stay for the discussion uh, session at the end. But as, a, as Jan said, if you have any questions you want to put to me, uh, please do put them into the Q&A box um, while I'm speaking and I'll get to as many as I can. I've purposely um, made it so that I won't be speaking for the full 20 minute slot. Um, so now I'm going to do the most difficult part of the presentation, as always, which is to try and share my slides, which I suspect is going to be, I think you should be able to see those now. Would that be okay? Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to I'm going to cover just, um, I was thinking, obviously, for a little bit about what exactly to cover, because there's so much to cover when one is talking about care, the role of carers, um, the burden of carers, etc. And I decided to just do a, an overview of a, a few important issues and also a particular issue that both as a consultant psychiatrist and also as medical director, I feel is quite important, which is communication or sometimes lack thereof. And I'd be very happy to hear your views on how this could be improved both at, at both ends. So I'm going to talk about care involvement and outcome fairly generally. I'm then going to talk about the domains of care engagement, because there, there are quite a few uh, domains. Um, I, I won't I'll talk about some of them more than others. I'm going to just lay the background about the changing landscape in, in which we work now compared to, say, 20, 30 years ago, because it's changing quite a lot in terms of legislation, in terms of even, even philosophically of, of how we, we view things in terms of healthcare, And then the, the last slide will be a few practical issues and maybe a, a few attempts at how we might overcome them. So without any further ado, internationally, when you look at good quality data, um, and they usually come from surveys, national surveys, looking into carers' uh, involvement. Um, uh, if we look, for example, at the USA, uh, back admittedly in 2014, which is the last year for which we have really, really good data for this, 43.5 million adults were carers uh, in 2014. That's one in seven of the population of, of the United States, 60% of whom were female. Um, it's an extraordinary uh, amount of people involved in, in caring for, for their loved ones, their spouses, relatives, friends, etc. 
if we look more specifically at mental health uh, um, in the mental health domain, and we go to Australia again, good data from um, from government documents and and, and uh, uh, resource documents that about four percent, one in twenty five uh, ad- people um, were carers for people with a mental health problem uh, or disorder in two thousand fifteen. Of those, when you break it down a little bit, about uh, two in five or forty percent uh, were carers for their partner. About a third of those were. Uh, carers for a parent, and about a fifth of those were um, carers for for a child uh, or their children. On average, um, carers, when you take it all together, um, they spent about 40 uh, hours a week um, uh, looking after whoever the person they looked after. That's, if you like, 40 40 hours is is, is the equivalent of a full-time job, isn't it? and interestingly, and I think this is this is one that that you know I don't think is exclusive to Australia. Twelve percent of those carers were were you were young. They were aged between fifteen and twenty four. I mean, some of these people were under the age of eighteen. They weren't even adults, and they were in the role of carers. So the the care issue, uh, for want of a much better word, it's a big one. It's not just uh, something on the sidelines. And I think we all know this. Uh, everybody who's attending this webinar. Care involvement is almost always a good thing. I, I'm sorry, I had to put up the almost in there. I never say always or never to anything. And of course, I think we know, although care involvement is almost uh, always a good thing, there, there are always exceptions to these things and we should, we should acknowledge them. I could have taken any mental health disorder here, but as usual, schizophrenia and psychotic disorders are usually the ones that are best researched in terms of, of various things. And, and that is the case, certainly, in terms of care involvement. These are data from um, the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews, which is generally the go-to place when you're looking for a synthesis of the highest uh, quality evidence for something. And indeed, they have looked at um, family involvement in, tr- in treatment plans for individual psychosis. Uh, for individuals with psychosis. And what did they find when they looked at all the high quality studies? Well, um, and and again, this is probably no surprise to most of us, um, when families are actively involved in treatment plans for for, for people um, with with psychotic illnesses such as schizophrenia, it reduces relapse rates by up to 20%, particularly if that family involvement isn't just sort of for a week or two. If If it's longer than three months, that effect is actually even more powerful. Again, unsurprisingly, perhaps. When we look at hospital admission rate, which is kind of in itself is obviously very important, but it's also a proxy for uh, how somebody is in, in general in terms of their overall mental health. Uh, family involvement reduces hospital admission or readmission rates by up to 30%, by up to a third. And if you think about it, and most of you I'm sure here will, will know the effects of a loved one or, or someone one cares for going into hospital, it's, 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 it can be very traumatic for the person themselves. It can also be a great disruption and traumatic for the family, it's, uh, for the family themselves. So reducing that by a third is, 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 is quite a powerful thing. And again, indeed, um, uh, when we look at compliance or concordance with medication, um, a family or carers being involved in um, uh, in the treatment plan encourages and increases compliance uh, by up to forty percent, uh, particularly when it comes to taking medication. So, and and I mean, we, we all kind of know this. It makes sense. It, it's common, almost intuitive. But the data are also there to back up that family involvement um, in in. Uh, uh, people's care plans is a good thing. It, it leads to better outcomes. And of course, we talk about care and engagement as if it's some sort of simple binary thing, either someone is engaged or, or they're not. But of course, things are more complex than that. And this is quite a, a nice paper for just published last year by Mabry and colleagues in, in BMC Health Services Research. They did a few things in this paper, but the thing I'd like to draw your attention to is this. They, they looked through all the available good quality literature on what the types or the domains of care engagement were. And I thought it was just useful to list these and, and go through them briefly uh, because a certain sort of pattern or, uh, emerges. Obviously, the first three are, well, I'll, I'll say straightforward. Um, obviously, when somebody is, is uh, receiving care, to identify and acknowledge the existence of family and carers, um, you know, surprise, surprise, um, engage and communicate with the family care and carers once you've identified them, and then also involve those family and carers in the planning and collaboration in the individual individual's treatment or care plan. So those first two are very much in terms of involving family for the um, for the good of the person themselves who's receiving treatment. You notice then from from four onwards, though, it gets it, it shifts. The focus shifts from the the needs of the the individual, the the, the person who's receiving treatment, to the family or uh, members or carers themselves. So. 
you know, one of the domains is actually assessing a vulnerable family member or carer's needs. And these are areas which, which we're, um, we're getting better at. And, and indeed, uh, the uh, speakers like Linda and, and Gary and Siobhan will, will be speaking perhaps more to these. But it's still, I think, a place where services and indeed institutions and indeed nationally, we should be paying increasing attention to. Um, providing or offering ongoing support to family and carers. And I think we're getting better at doing that and providing psychoeducation to family and carers, ditto. And then the, I think that the trickiest one, um, uh, providing or recommending referrals for family and carers. Um, and that's that's difficult because, um, I mean, it, it, it's important, but I suppose at the moment that tends to be done on a, if we pick up that there might be an issue, we might mention to the carer or family member, would you consider maybe discussing that with somebody, maybe going to your GP to see if you need help? Um, we don't tend to provide that within our own services. And there are good reasons for that potentially, because often we don't look after uh, uh, two, mem two members of the same family under the same team. But, um, you know, per perhaps there's, there's room to improve that. Um, at the moment, it's it's kind of fairly opportunistic when it happens. And of course, one of the challenges, uh, and it goes back to the first two of those domains, is to acknowledge the existence of family members and then to communicate with them. Um, I was, I was talking to the other panelists earlier and, and I was saying when I was a trainee psychiatrist back in the early 90s, um, we used to fairly freely contact family members on the basis that it was in the patient's best interest and um, that we were doing the right thing. Quite a paternalistic approach. Um, now, of course, particularly in the last five years, I'd argue, there's an awful lot of activity um, and the culture is, is changing, I think, for the better. Um, but nonetheless, it poses certain challenges. And I've just gone through these here. So the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, for example, uh, which uh, um, has been ratified by, by Ireland, um, it, it's got numerous articles, over 20 articles. But running through the whole framework of that document is a person's right to autonomy, of choice, of dignity, of privacy, of confidentiality um, and of equality. And these are these are things that that have to be respected and have to be really integrated into into our into our services. And indeed, they increasingly are, thankfully. Um, the proposed new mental health act, which which some of you may be or may not be aware of, um, there are a lot of changes coming down the line in terms of um, the mental health act. But one of the one of the most important ones is the basic principle and the, the, the current and soon to be superseded, I suspect, Mental Health Act works, works based on a best interests approach. And um, so, in other words, we, we do what's in the, or we feel and the courts feel or whoever is in the best interests of that patient. But the new Mental Health Act is going to be very much more about an autonomy based approach. What does the, what does the individual want? Um, and, and what are their wishes, and really in as far as uh, is as possible to acknowledge and to, to act on those wishes. Um, and indeed, that's mirrored in the, the almost the twinned Assisted Decision Making Act, which is kind of already enacted, but um, and is going to be actually up and running almost imminently. Um, again, without going into detail, but it's giving people the autonomy to make decisions and advanced decisions about their treatment um, and about their affairs uh, in a way that uh, didn't exist before. Um, and of course, we all know about GDPR, which has again been in place since uh, the middle of 2018, which places very strict and, and uh, uh, limits on, uh, um, on confidentiality, both for organizations and individuals, and big fines and penalties if, if organizations don't comply with the, with the strictures of, of GDPR. And then I've, I put in brackets at the end, not so much that it's all relevant here, but it's just another, I suppose, sense in terms of legislation that things are very much going down an autonomy and a personal choice route. So we're even proposing legislation. Now, it seems to have stalled for the moment, but I'm sure it'll, it'll I was going to say resurrect, um, it'll, it'll, it'll be back on the table at some point. Um, but the idea that we're giving people um, the right and the ability to choose the when and the where and even the how, perhaps, of, how, of, of, of their death. Um, so everything culturally, legislatively, um, uh, and um, is, 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 is moving towards really having to respect, quite rightly, people's confidentiality. But of course, that creates a, a tension, doesn't it? Because at the, on the, uh, we're talking here about um, uh, a carer's role, and one of those is to communicate, and yet um, our ability to communicate in certain circumstances can be uh, can be difficult, and I think there is a chasm there sometimes of, of understanding that that we need to try and resolve. Um, and and this is my last slide, and this is this is almost like a little checklist of things that I uh, that I'm going to put out to you. Um, 
but just to make the point that whenever somebody is either in hospital or even just receiving treatment in our services, whether it's in day programs, home care, um, our outpatient dean clinics or an inpatient, if we want to communicate uh, with with a family member or a carer about anything uh, about any to any individual, we need that we need that person's consent. That has to be forthcoming, um, and without it, we cannot contact a person, no matter how much we'd like to. There are plenty of situations I remember as a consultant where the team has been absolutely dying to talk to the family and haven't had the permission, um, and and we haven't been able to. The other thing I'd point out, it, it's it's kind of just a, a bullet point because it's something that comes up quite regularly, is that um, often people ring up and say, I, I want you to tell me about my son, daughter, parent, whatever. And we say, well, we don't have the, um, our consent, but we'll come back to if we have consent. And somebody will say, well, I'm their next of kin. The next of kin in these circumstances has no legal basis. In fact, we've stopped using uh, a, few, a couple of years ago um, the... the, the uh, the term next of kin. Um, when we're admitting somebody, we'll ask them who their preferred contact person is. Um, and that's very much in terms of uh, if they want us to contact somebody or if there's an emergency, who is their preferred person. But people, I think, and it, it, it's grown over time that next of kin somehow has some magical um, door opening properties. It doesn't, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> I think a useful point to remember, and, and some of you may know this, is that although even if we don't have consent to con communicate uh, from you to from us to you as a carer there's nothing stopping carers um ringing uh, our team secretary and giving information that um you feel the team might uh, feel is relevant so in other words while we may not have consent to speak to you you have you are able to ring um uh, the team's administrator or secretary and um leave information with them that can be passed on to the clinical team and i think that's a useful thing to know it still doesn't get around the fact that communication is one way but often people feel frustrated that they can't get the information to us but there's always a route to get information to a clinical team the other thing to remember i suppose is that consent can change um, in the same as most of the things in life change, just because someone says, I don't, particularly in an early part of an admission, perhaps when somebody's acutely unwell or maybe even psychotic or whatever, um, somebody might say, under no circumstances do I want you to contact my family or friends. But we review this during the course of admission or even during the course of attending us and outpatients to ask them how their views change. And we'll even explain to them why it would be useful for us to speak to a family member or even to have a family meeting. And, and oftentimes that consent does change as a person's condition improves. So from our point of view just to let you know we're we're regularly reviewing that consent we don't just um uh, ask about consent on day one and if it's refused then that's that's done that's dusted we will review that but again this isn't perfect i, I bring it up i suppose because it is something that is a, a regular occurrence and it's a cause of great frustration and distress and anything that we can do to improve that uh uh, that communication, whether it's information or, or, or a particular system, I we would be all ears to hear about that. And at those points, I suppose I'm going to wrap it up and um, I'm more than happy if there are any questions that anybody would like to ask uh, to feel those questions. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Paul. That was really interesting. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, just as you were speaking there, it struck me, you know, can you talk a little bit about, I'm sure we'll go into this in a little bit more detail mm -hmm. later, but when you were talking about autonomy and how things have shifted to we now sort of prize autonomy for somebody in their recovery, why is autonomy? Why is it important to protect their autonomy? I mean, I think it's interesting when you look. At, I mentioned the first one I mentioned was the the um, the convent, the UN Convention on on uh, Human uh, Rights for People with Disabilities. And it's a very interesting document because it's it's got over, I think it's over 20, maybe even over 30 articles that cover pretty much every domain of a person's life and, and also uh, um, the nation's life. And what we're doing, if you, if, you, if you draw it straight back, what we're doing when we're seeing anybody and trying to help them is to put them on the road to recovery. And that recovery for most people um, presumably means independence and autonomy and getting on with their life. What we would love to see in an ideal world, if everything was perfect, that somebody comes to us with an issue, we help them to sort it, it's sorted out so well that we never need to see them again, that they're they're discharged forever and they get on and live, with, live their lives. Now that happens with, with a fair few people, but um, even recovery can be 
recovery can doesn't have to be that it, it can actually be somebody going from a certain stage in their life to recovering to the extent that even though they may have some residual symptoms they're still able to go back to their job to their relationship etc and yes they may have certain times when things aren't perfect but they're still able to live a, an autonomous life what we're striving for is for people to to, to get back I mean again I'll go back to my my early training in psychiatry and even as, even as a medical student where things were very paternalistic and there was almost a presumption particularly in mental health that if you did develop a major health disorder that that was you sort of for life going to be needing treatment we know for example sorry I'm straying a little bit <clears throat> but if we look at studies of schizophrenia which used to be thought of as this disorder that once you get it you're going to have it from the day you have it until the day you die and you're going to be involved in services and the part of the reason for that was that the studies looking at the outcome for schizophrenia concentrated on people who are still in institutions are still attending services so surprise surprise but with the better studies that have been done over the last 20 years where we've really been careful to follow up anybody who presented for the first time with schizophrenia and to follow them up, particularly if they've recovered, because it's the recovered people that are harder to track down because they may have emigrated. They may have dropped off the system. They may not even want to talk to you because they don't want to be reminded of those days 20 years ago when they had their one and only psychotic episode. But when studies put a lot, a lot of effort into tracing a high proportion of people that they originally saw, you'll find that about a third of people with schizophrenia who have an episode of schizophrenia never have another episode. They fully recover and go back to their life. About a third of them have a sort of an intermittent course where they're well in between episodes and about a third then have a more continuous course. But the fact of the matter is that schizophrenia, and I'm just taking that as an example because it's the sort of the well-known one, having a diagnosis of schizophrenia or getting a diagnosis isn't that sort of doom and gloom sort of uh, and and there it is my my path is now laid out that we used to think 30 years ago it's a lot different so there's a lot more optimism there quite rightly so as well and I think the way our services are shaped and um, the way they're increasingly being shaped towards a recovery model reflects quite rightly that optimism and um, that's not to say that things are easy but actually that there is hope there and things can always improve. Mm. Um, I'm just we have a question in from Rachel mm. and it's just mm. regarding the domain of needs mm. and she was mentioning that in the UK in the NHS they had carers assessors mm. and you know not they not only went out and talked with the carers but they also gave them support psychological mm. and otherwise maybe even in some cases respite yeah. and took the issues to the team meetings when discussing a particular patient yeah. now you know they didn't treat them as an active patient unless yeah, they were yeah, an active yeah, patient, but yeah. including them and having someone who was there speaking with them, listening yeah. to them, um, gave, gave a huge insight. So Rachel was sort of wondering, you know, why are these roles not included or even removed rather than expanded formally mm. under the mm. mental health teams? Mm. No, I mean, I think that's something that all services need to work on and it's it's a work in progress. And the NHS tends to be a little bit ahead of us in, in, in most things. Um, I mean, a, a lot of the initiatives that are going to be talked about today are efforts to address that. We, I mean, it, it's, um, although we don't formally do it, I mean, we don't have outreach because we're, we're, we're a national service and we can't provide an outreach um, apart from, I suppose, home care, etc. But um, yes, I mean, I think it's something that does need to, to be addressed in a more kind of systematic way. As I mentioned in my talk, we do we do tend to pick up when uh, um, there may be a, um, a, um, a carer who may need extra support or whatever, and we do bring it back to the team. Um, uh, but generally that tends to be not done and um, that whatever support is there isn't provided by certainly us in St. Patrick's. It, 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 it can't be at the moment, but we do tend to sort of, uh, with their permission, either ask them to contact their, their GP or whatever to discuss that. But yeah, um, it, 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 it's largely a resource issue and it's also a development thing. It's, it, it's something we're getting towards, you know. So you think potentially in the future, it might be something that does become more of a factor Oh, I think it needs to become more of a factor. Mm. I mean, th those numbers that I gave in, the, I think, the second slide, you know, yeah. um, not, and, and there are going to be more care as the time goes on. You know, if we if we if we concentrate just on older people, for example, people who are going to get dementia, you know, the likelihood is, in fact, it's more than likelihood. There's only one reason why it mightn't happen. Um, but the likelihood is that in 20 years time, the number of um, people over the age of 65 with dementia will have, you know, bloomed. Um, and so uh, and we're not keeping pace with, in terms of nursing home um, uh, places more importantly in terms of assisted living places because everybody thinks nursing homes are the answer to everything and they're not there are lots of people who shouldn't be in nursing homes but because there's no other place anyway that's a whole other point the only reason why the, 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 
um, dementia might not increase the way people predict is because I think a lot of people um, uh, sort of maybe around the age of 50 and younger are uh, taking more exercise, the diets are better and they're making, uh, they're making, they're cognitively exercising a bit more and there may be just a chance that that will certainly um, attenuate that curve. But nonetheless, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so we need to be thinking about these things um, in advance because carers, um, whatever about the numbers now, they're going to be more carers around, uh, you know, in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years time. Yeah, and of course, given that, we have to be sure that that phrase of caring for the carers, but it's so essential. Um, I am conscious of time yeah. and that you're, now there is one other question there for you, Paul, but we might direct that to you directly because I'm conscious your time needs to, sure. you, you sure. need to go and we need to move on because we've, we've gone past the time. But just to say to David, we will address that question a little bit later. Thank you, Paul. Take care and we'll see you again soon. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. OK, so next up is Linda Curran, who's a social worker here at St. Patrick's. And Linda is going to discuss the family perspective on mental health recovery. So I'll hand over to you, Linda. Great, thanks. I just uh, hopefully you can you can see that as well, Jan, um, as part of the conversation, just some slides that I'll find while I'll be focusing on. So um, I'm a social work team leader here and I'll be focusing a bit around the social work role and families, what some of our, our work looks like. It's a special interest area of mine, uh, implements the programme here. I'll outline some of the details, that specific one. And we'll also talk a bit about how you can access information because um, as we know, it can be a bit of a, a minefield if you're like going onto Google or YouTube, it can be quite overwhelming some of the responses that can come back. So I'd like to signpost your uh, attention to some places that you might be able to, to get information that's relevant to you and your needs at this time. So as a social worker, we're very interested in someone's so uh, you know their environment, all these uh, social factors that can impact on their their mental health. So we often, at the root of our work, we complete a psychosocial assessment. And if you see that Venn diagram there, so we focus on the individual. We think about all what aspects are arising for them: their emotional needs, psychological, social factors. Um, any physical health issues and other environmental contexts in which they live. And then we consider that environment in a bit more in depth. Uh, so there can be financial stressors. We're not social welfare officers, of course, but we can point people in the direction um, if they need support around some of that, signpost them within the social welfare system of things that might be helpful for them. Try and provide them with some psychoeducation if they've been given a diagnosis. It might be um, a new thing for them, so to, to help them understand what's been said in the teams, because often we must take responsibility for that. It's not just the years, uh, the information. We, we need to make sure that that's understood uh, by everyone involved. And an equal part of all that in, in our assessments, then, is as Paul has outlined, if we have center as much as we can we try to involve the family uh, we, we know that that's very uh, a crucial part of it as well sometimes we can be quite interested in looking at issues around parenting capacity family roles more general and um, if people are taking on a, a care and role within that so that's at the, the hub of what we do. So oftentimes we will be facilitating family meetings uh, and we'll be trying to get people as involved as possible. Because really, when you, when you think about it, the, the hospital environment, it's quite a, a short, even if someone's having a long admission in the scale of their life or in the duration of how they're managing their recovery, we're, you know, we're not intended to be the, the star here. It's when people go home and they have a chance to, to work on, on their recovery and building forward into the next chapter of their life and working on the wellness that they want to achieve. So for family members, I think a, a big struggle can be, and, and part of what our role might be, is trying to identify and help them see where they situate themselves. Not everyone that has uh, you know, a loved one with mental health or addiction issues will identify with the term care or support. Or there can be a myriad of reasons for why this is the case. For example, we know that perhaps uh, mothers and spouses, wives especially, there could be a gender aspect to that, that sometimes men don't realise that some of the tasks and 
activities that they're involved in are very much trying to be a key supporter along someone's uh, mental health recovery. So I'll get into that in a bit more detail when I talk about family connections, but actively we would seek out talking to siblings and you know if there's uh, and so it's really about who's the care the key person so if we go back to that assessment who does the person that's in front of us the the patient who are they identifying as some of the key supporters within their life their key family members who are they who are they living with and so on so we know that supporting someone else is sometimes called caring. You are a carer if you provide unpaid support and care for someone who has an illness, disability, mental health problem or addiction. And these can often shift and change over time. We might be having family meetings where people are reflecting back on, on perhaps prior to admission. They, they weren't so sure about different things. It was a point of high stress. They were trying to figure out what's the best support and, and how to help their loved one. They might know what was happening. So uh, they might find then through a, a later point that the relationship shifts back then and it's back to more the equal footing that it had been um, uh, and the normal give and take of a relationship. So someone might identify as a carer or supporter for a particular time period but it's not that that's set in stone no more than if someone has a, a mental health diagnosis or addiction issue that that's set in stone for eternity that that's a part of a, a label or an identity for them so you know you might be spending uh, a lot of time supporting someone else but oftentimes and it can be when people are looking back that they see that they in fact were taken on uh, a caring role and, and for people sometimes they can uh, you know not define themselves in those terms because they think it's it's just part of their role if you are someone's parent if you are their family member it's you know it's your responsibility and it's a, a part of being in a relationship whatever that might be with that person um, and you might be providing support other than physical or practical support so sometimes when we think of carers we think of, of someone perhaps that is not able to tend to their physical care needs and um, that needs help kind of getting their shopping or cooking or, or bathing or something like that and they and, and they discount then those times that you were there emotionally for someone that you were there helping to practically give them information and um, when, when they really needed uh, someone outside themselves to, to help give them a bit of support and encouragement so we would say that is all part of that and Sometimes people think it needs to be defined by some outside uh, service like ourselves here in, in St. Pat's or some other type of social uh, or medical service. And then that there's, that's where the caring label comes from. But I think it's it's to trust your own uh, assessment of that. And as Paul has outlined, a considerable amount of time can go into to kind of offering that care uh, and guidance towards someone when they're at a point when they really need it. And some of that information taken from the minds.co.uk, that's a, a UK uh, based mental health charity, that they, they have some of that. But another definition that I found interesting uh, and helpful to really highlight and name during this conversation as well from that same website. So Caring for someone with a mental health condition is hard. The invisibility of the illness can make it feel like you're not a real carer. Trust me, you are, and you're making a huge difference to someone's life. So oftentimes we would have people coming in here and they have a mental health diagnosis and they, and they might feel for themselves, there can be an internal process of seeing that mental illness is just like illness, physical illness and it can impact us and, and impact on our relationships, our lives in the same sort of way but the, the invisibility of it gets to them so that extends to you too as family members as carers it can feel like well you know it's not like there's a there's a physical thing uh going on here but really to name that that you too are, are playing a, a key care and support role for someone so where possible uh and we kind of already mentioned a bit about how the permissions for these can change, but we might work with the individual around if it would be helpful, uh, you know, who's their key supporter, how involved do, do you want them to be, and, and kind of having those family support meetings and those conversations and deciding together what's realistic, um, because there might be a, a lot of things unsaid. So there's a, a kind of an outline from Barkadal in 2012. It was a, a guide 
for caregivers of people with a disorder. So when you think of the caregiver, so that might be the, the family member, the spouse, what support we are really trying to focus in? What's realistic for you to provide? And is there an opportunity to name it? If it's not, you, you might be the only person. So how can we make sure then that it's not just all fallen to you and what would you prefer to to provide uh, and then the other person as well the person that's experiencing mental health at that time it, it's up to them as well to decide what support that they might need what they might want and how to communicate that with each other because I suppose some of those things and um, it can be difficult to always communicate around them and our role here as social workers and other members of the MDT where possible is to facilitate that space to have those conversations uh, in a really focused way uh, that mightn't be so easy uh, you know after discharge or when you're having your normal visiting times or so on and all, all these things are on a, con a continuum very much depends on the illness, the you know, the severity of it, the duration, and, and the kind of what consequences might arise. And if there's other people around, what other supports can we get in that might be helpful? So on the topic of support, we when we're making our care and discharge plans, it, it certainly is often focused primarily on the person that's here. And that is because of legislative reasons that are specific to the Mental Health Act in Ireland. Uh, and the justice support framework and how those things are outlined within that. Um, so I suppose there's there's kind of wider things that need to be changed there as well to, to kind of bring in um, to bring in family members and carers that they too, like in the UK jurisdiction, have their own care plan, but that is legislated for within there uh, and how it operates is is would be somewhat uh, different uh, as well. So just some of the ideas then around different family supports, it's very much based on what someone's, um, what's, ha what's happening for you. Do you have children? Is there older people? What's the specific diagnosis around that? So there's a whole raft of supports available for children. Um, like, so they might need a space to discuss what it's like for them if they, their parent is experiencing mental health or addiction issues, um, or they might have their own kind of support needs. And there's, there is an Ireland, there's a network of supports when we think of the family support, uh, or family resource centers, Bernardo's, Tusla, um, they might have some ideas as well if, if people are kind of struggling around some of the, the safety issues. Family Carers Islands, they have a, a good website in general for, for people that are, are family carers. They have different events, so that might be useful looking up uh, their, their website. And in, nationally, then, there's different recovery colleges, um, so they might have support then for family members, as do AWARE. AWARE have an online family support program um, uh, that's kind of self-directed, so they might have some information there. And like, you know, if your loved one is a, an older person that are experiencing uh, some type of dementia, Alzheimer's Ireland, they can be uh, a great resource as well. For those impacted, which uh, if there's what well, we would separate it and it's on that list, but if there's issues uh, where you don't feel safe, if there's issues of kind of control or, or violence, that's quite different in a way, but it needs its own specific support. So what I would say to people, if they're, you know, do reach out to the team if you're in a position where you, you don't feel safe or there's some kind of issue like that. But Safe Ireland have, have quite a good website around what resources are available to you nationally if you feel that, uh, you know, there's, there's a risk of anything like that. So these supports, they can be like one to one. You might be setting up a one to one session with someone like, for example, if someone's experiencing addiction, you might call up your local family support network uh, office and they will link you up with someone that you can have a session, talk through some of those uh, issues around the addiction. But for some people, and I'll, I'll go through some of the, the research on that, but groups can be really powerful as well. And it really is down to personal preference. But they, they can be quite useful because it can, can feel quite a, a lonely experience being a carer. So having like minded kin around you that are going through not the same experience, but a similar path to you as well. So Al-Anon is a very well-known addiction support that's kind of like a, a steps for the family members. If, if people are trying to support someone through addiction, that can be a, a helpful one also. And then there can be more structured family support programs that are 
professional led as opposed to peer support led. So I, that, an example of that would be family connections and I'll go through that. Um, but all of those can be quite diagnosis specific and that can be quite helpful because it's not a uh, general mental health. It's really focusing in on what some of the things that you might be able to, to relate to and how you can support someone and yourself with that as well. So as we get down then a bit more specific, the mental health recovery of family perspective, there's a webinar series um, and I'd invite you to have a look at that on the St. Patrick's website. We can put the link in the chat uh, after that, but I've included it on the slide there as well. So this is a free information series for families and carers of people living with a mental health uh, or addiction difficulty. And there's a whole range of different topics. So I think it can be quite scary for families. You know, you might start Googling schizophrenia, bipolar, uh, personality disorder, and you're, and you're getting all kinds of information in. Uh, but there's no siphon in that, or it can be just, you, you can go on a real um, rabbit hole. It can be great to get a, a varied range of information, but I would recommend to people if you're, Kind of starting out with some of this or trying to get a, a general idea of some of it, it might be a good port of call to look at some of these uh, lectures that might be very specific to you. They're recorded, they're available on the website. There might be a few more coming up so you can register to attend those live as well. But they're, they're a hub of information for you to access. And it can be useful as well if you are communicating with the team that you've had to watch these first uh, and that you've got some information. So because oftentimes family members might call after and they've had loads of questions or things might come to mind and they feel like they've, they've missed their chance. So it might be helpful to have a look at some of those things. And of course, the door is all, you know, if the door is open and there's no block to having that open communication, you can come, come back after these things and ask a few follow on questions which would be made clear by whoever's facilitating that family meeting with yourself. So some of the topics that are available that might be of interest to you if you're having a look through them as well. So there's a general one on information and advocacy for family recovery. So that might be a good one to watch if you have, um, you know, just in general, you're trying to understand the, the hospital system or how to interact with that for the, for the best of your loved one and for yourself. Our head of psychology has done a presentation around trauma and how the impact of that and how you as family members can understand that uh, a little bit more and then kind of goes through different data and services available. So definitely if, if trauma, you think that might be an issue, it would be good to have a look at that one too. I myself, I work in addiction and dual diagnosis. That would be a special interest area of mine. A, there's a presentation up there around addiction and dual diagnosis and the family, how to link into different supports and some guidance there around navigating change, the wheel of change, how you can support it, because uh, I suppose none of us can decide for someone else around their recovery, unfortunately, but we can certainly uh, be a really powerful presence in, in support and encouraging that. A specialist nurse and psychologist have done a good overview of what we refer to as eating distress. So that's if someone's having issues with perhaps eating too much, too little food, the issues around anorexia, bulimia and so on. That's a really good lecture there that outlines a lot of that. Uh, our family therapist, Noelle Mean, she works in Willow Grove and she talks specifically about adolescent mental health. So you might be parents or you might have a, a younger sibling um, or, or a niece or nephew that's in the CAMS, we call child and adolescent mental health unit at, at, at this time so that would also be a really good one there bipolar uh, and so we've different nurse specialists that would give presentations around bipolar affective disorder uh, anxiety and uh, the most recent one and I think really important as well is minding your own mental health in the care and role it's a really um, beautiful thing to be able to care for someone and offer them support as well but it's all, also been mindful that that too can be difficult and a, a journey for yourself. And there might be just making sure that you're resourced to do that uh, before taking it on. So I'll finish by just presenting a little bit about family connections. That's a 
specific intervention, a specific group for people. If you have a loved one that has uh, a diagnosis of emotional stable personality disorder, or it's also referred to as borderline personality disorder. So I implemented this back in uh, 2019, and it's been running about four or five times a year since that date. So this is a, an active family group that's running within the hospital. Please do reach out to myself or, or you know, uh, your team if this would be a helpful intervention for you. So that might be if your loved one is talking about that they have been recommended to do DBT, so that's dialectical behavior therapy, or what we previously called it in St. Pat's, they had a, a program. Um, it's just gone out of my mind now, but they do refer to it uh, as, as DBT. I think it was living through distress or that is, is what they called it previous to that. So when you have a personality disorder, when you reach the criteria for that, and that can change in time, it's kind of a, a good news diagnosis in the way it can shift uh, as, as more information comes in um, and that you learn different skills. But what helps with emotion regulation is these skills of DBT. And in a way, it's like learning a new language for yourself to help you manage uh, emotional fluctuations. So what we do in Family Connections is we try and teach you, the family member, the loved one, the same language and skills so that you can support them and understand and, and support yourself really with understanding what might be helpful. Some of this research is very similar to what uh, Paul has already outlined. It's efforts specific to the area of personality disorder. So oftentimes the things we're looking out for, how do we know what we're doing is useful for family members? Well, we know if people do family connections, this sort of structured program, the person themselves with the diagnosis of the UPD, they're much less likely to relapse if their family members are coming along with them. So really super powerful role that you can play there uh, in helping and supporting them with that. Uh, and we know, even though the family meetings are great, it's often something we do as part of social work and other disciplines engage with them, of course, as well. But we know when people have a chance to do a very structured, detailed support programme like this, the benefits tend to be far greater, kind of longer lasting. Um, and when you think about it, I suppose it's the time that goes into it. Family meeting, you might have you know, two one hour family meetings, whereas a program like this, it's, it's kind of a commitment over a few weeks. Um, and, and you're getting that not only input from professionals, but from people that have walked the path the same as yourself, other family carers that have much uh, value and learning that you can offer each other. Um, and we know, as we've already kind of said, it is something that we're always working towards because family involvement, that's what's indicated as the best national, international guidelines. So though there might be kind of deficits there, it's what the HSC recommending, the NICE guidelines and so on. We know this is a, a really admirable goal to strive towards because we really recognise the value uh, and, and work of family carers play. So that's just the outline of the programme. I can go into that into a bit more detail if anyone's interested, um, but that's just to kind of cast your eye over the different things around education rooms, the, the disorder, uh, and then different skills that can be helpful for you to take forward and, and look at and your own self-care uh, and, and really working with each other as a group through that. So there can be great benefits then for people uh, in terms of we know if someone's in a family care role, it can impact on your mental health. People can be reporting like feelings of depression and, uh, and burden and grief. And but we know once people get a bit of support that can dissipate. They, all that can go down and that they can feel a bit more empowered and not so uh, lonely with, within what it is that they have to do. We've done some analysis of people that have come through it, uh, kind of get, gotten feedback from them. I have to say it has been very positive. So from past experience of it, it might be something that's worthwhile. And I think this would be true of any of the family programs that you might find, whether within this service or you know, in some of the organizations that they've mentioned as well. Uh, we know that the, the, the really getting that support can be helpful for them. And I've included some direct quotes that, that people have said, and I might just draw your attention uh, specifically to, to one around focus on self-care and the importance of looking after ourselves too. So even after today, it might be something that you are reflecting on 
you know, all this, you're probably attending this because you, you care deeply about someone and you're trying to figure out how you can help them and in turn help yourself. But it is so important to, to remember about that, that self-care piece. Um, and if people are a bit unsure about groups, there is a bit of feedback there. You'll see about people saying, not feeling so alone. So that was kind of, people were kind of shocked really about how much they got from the others in the group. Because it's, you know, it's, it might mean people might have a general idea that your loved one is going through something and they might have a general idea that it's difficult for you. But to really sit down and talk and share about what things are like with people that get it, that are living a, a, a similar uh, thing, that can be so, so powerful too. Uh, and really, as they, as they say, invaluable. So just to finish then... I just to reiterate, we know the family members, you play a key role in supporting your loved one with their mental health and addiction recovery. People can get well when they're kind of doing their own thing, but if they're lucky enough to have good family support uh, and that's helpful and useful for them, we know that it's, it's going to be great for them to have that going forward. Don't forget your own care and support needs. Um, and there's a number of ways you can get information. So I, I do think the St. Patrick's.ie website is very good. That family webinar series is, is another good one as well. I have a little asterisk beside this, but communicate with the loved ones, MDT. As we say, you can communicate with us, unfortunately, if the consent is withdrawn or there's something like that going on, we mightn't be able to always give you back the, the detailed response. Um, but also we, we, we're kind of working towards family meetings where that might be helpful too. So I think I've gone a wee bit over, but thanks for um, your time. And I, I think towards the end, then there might be time for um, a group question. So thanks for, for listening. Thank you, Linda. That was really interesting. Thanks. And we will have time for questions at the end. And certainly you were mentioning there the family information service or series rather, which has had, you know, some great feedback. And I just want to let you know that the link for that has been popped into the chat there. So you'll be able to watch the series so far there and it'll be kicking off again in the autumn. So you can keep an eye on St. Patrick's.ie forward slash events to see when the next one is scheduled. So thanks again, Linda. We'll talk to you later for questions. So now just uh, we're going to move on to Gary. Gary Kieran, a for Kieran, a former service user at St. Patrick's and a member of the Service Users and Supporters Council who helped to organise today's event. Um, Gary's kindly agreed to share his personal experience of what it's like having his family involved in his mental health recovery journey. So good morning, Gary, if you want to turn on your, your uh, video there, we can have oh, a chat. Hopefully it's on, is it? It is indeed, yeah, I see you there. Yeah. And uh, if people have questions as we're going through this, feel free to pop them in the, the Q&A box and we'll, we'll get to them later. Um, mm -hmm. So I suppose, Gary, we may start at the beginning. So if you tell us, you know, about <laughs> your own mental health recovery journey, like when do you think the recovery process started for you? OK, uh, thanks for having me. And uh, just to say good morning to all the great carers who are uh, listening in or maybe listening to this uh, when it's put on the website because uh, I just know from my experience that without my carers, without people uh, being there for me, certainly uh, I wouldn't be as well as I am now. And, and that's for sure. So uh, on a personal level, just to, to say that, uh, not patronizing, but the say a real thank you uh, and good morning to everybody. Uh, about four years ago or so, um, I, uh, I, I won't say I, I, I was diagnosed, well, I was diagnosed with mental health, but I suppose I knew in my own heart that I had something going on uh, before that. So it's been going on for longer than four years. But about four years ago or so, uh, I took the step to go to my GP and to uh, say, look, you know, something isn't right uh, the way I'm feeling it has changed uh, and, and I'm not too sure about how safe I am and to, to, to face up to that and for me that was a difficult thing I think it was difficult for two main reasons uh, one was because uh, I, I was a, a father you know and and uh, and I was used to being the the person who did all the caring for other people uh, both at home and in my work because I trained as a social worker uh, and I've worked for the last uh, 25 years or so in child protection. Uh, so 
it was it was difficult on all of those reasons, and I felt it was also difficult going to a GP, uh, and and I felt for many reasons I just felt that this was hard to say to him. You know, this isn't good. So I was admitted into hospitals living in West Waterford at the time, uh, and I spent a week or so in uh, the hospital in Waterford, and then. Uh, I'm one of the fortunate people that does have private health insurance and is able to get transferred to St. Patrick's. And um, when did my health recovery start? Do you know what? I think it was a good year or two after that. Uh, nice. Because I was admitted for, I think it was about three months. And I remember going through the doors. I remember going through the doors, first of all, of Waterford Hospital and then going through the doors of St. Pat's. Uh, and there was something in my head saying, you know, this is very different from other hospitals. This, you know, whether it was in Waterford that when I was being spoken to by the doctors there, I went into the room and I noticed that the table was screwed to the floor, the chairs were, there was just subtle differences. And going in then into the ward and it was almost like a room with a door at each end, a small corridor uh, and your bag being opened up and your belt being taken off you, your lace has been taken off you. And it was a real sense of powerlessness. A real, and it was frightening. It was frightening because uh, for probably the first time really that I felt that uh, I, I, was, I was vulnerable in, in a way mm. that nobody, I couldn't contact or I couldn't do anything. And I felt really frightened by that, almost claustrophobic by it. Uh, but I know, and I knew at the time that I needed help. And I think I was so, at that stage, I think I was just so tired, really. I, I just mm-hmm. thought, I, whatever, just give it to me, you know, <laughs> let, yeah. I'll do whatever. So it, that happened. And I think really around the first two months or so of being in hospital, it was a bit like that, of uh, needing. And, I, and looking back, and I think my body just needed to rest, you know. Well, as, as you start to get a little bit better, um, you, you kind of start to see, you know, okay, what's this mean? You know, if I have a mental health illness, is it an illness for life? Uh, and you start to think, oh, God, I wonder how are my family, you know, how are they coping with this? Uh, do I tell my friends and my friends know where I am? Um, at the beginning, all of that just kind of went over my head. But I suppose as you start to get it, for me, as I started to get a little bit better, they were the questions that came into my head. Uh, started more and more uh, and I know I can put words on it now like you know the stigma around having mental health illness uh, mm-hmm. and and all of these you know that as a man and as a father that I should always be the one that's in control of being able to care for others and that uh, and especially as, as you know when you when you want to always do the best for your children and that but I think that that's the part then uh in where you, where I felt then I started to get better. You know, my my recovery was happening because the reason maybe that I didn't go to my GP or anybody else before that was because they were all the questions in my head or they were all, you, you can't get sick, Gary. You're the mm. breadwinner. You can't get sick, Gary. You're the social work manager. You know, you can't get sick, Gary, because you're the one that knows all the answers, you know, uh, and and afraid to be able to come across as a person who does get sick and yeah. who doesn't have the answers and who can, uh, who does feel that I need people to mind me. I need people to take care of me. So I think for me, that was the start of my recovery uh, in, in around that, in around being, becoming aware of those questions. And then um, I was lucky I was under the care of uh, a very good team uh, when I on my first admission I was there for I think about three three and a half months uh, and just to say that my my diagnosis so I live with a uh, severe recurrent depression uh, but I've been well for the last year and a half I, I take medication and when I say well I mean that I haven't had an ambition but uh, but you're constantly you know trying to stay well but I, I remember that time then my family coming into me uh, and it was so new for them. I mean, mm. what about the shock for me, uh, for them? Because they're seeing someone who they love and, and who, who they, you know, and then they're, they're asking all the questions as well. They're saying, well, 
what happened, you know, or how did it happen, or uh, mm -hmm. and that. And, and and while the team, I think, while the consultant and the team were looking after me, their focus was on me. Uh, I think they felt a little bit that, that there was very little of any focus on them, you know, because they had all of these questions. And maybe it's just me and my personality, but then I, I was starting to take that on a little bit. I was starting to yeah. take on a little bit of their maybe frustration or their anxiety and that. Uh, and, and that was difficult. You know, that was difficult. Then you, I, I started to feel a little bit in the middle, you know, but I right. knew, I always knew though, I suppose, then that the team were trying to get me right, first of all, like as, as best healthy as I can. And then, uh, but we worked through it. And I think the only way that we worked through it was by, uh, well, I have very brilliant, loving children who don't let go of it and who are willing to say, no, hang on, we need to know a bit more about this and we need, we want to be there to care for you and, and that. Uh, and I suppose also that I, I did have a team that were able to say, yes, look, we know that that's there and we will come to it, trust us. And it did happen. We did have a family meeting. Family meetings can be a bit short, you know, they can be a little bit about the medication, they can be a little bit about, you know, uh, maybe the diagnosis and stuff like that. Uh, and I do think maybe it's an area that uh, I know I'm a member of the SUIS, which is a service users and supporters. Uh, one, of, one of the topics, and I'll come back to later if you wish, one of the, one of the issues we're looking at is, uh, is around that liaison between the service user and the medical team, the nursing staff, social work, and, and possibly also the, the carers now, as I think about it. Uh, and we're looking at, you know, something like the peer support, the role of a peer support worker within the hospital who will have had a lived experience of mental health illness and who can be that conduit, you know, between maybe the service user, family, multidisciplinary team and that. So, mm -hmm. so, so as Professor Fearon said at the beginning, you know, things are totally evolving all the time and we're learning and that. Uh, but going back to myself, that was a big... Uh, it was a big it was a big step uh being admitted into a hospital it was a big step for me admitting my own vulnerability uh and and then another thing that uh for me was because i suppose the nature of my work uh and you i felt you know having a mental health illness does this mean that i cannot be uh, a good social worker or a good social work manager does this mean that I cannot really be uh, there to help other people or to protect other people? Uh, and that took some thinking through for myself because I, I also was part of my, my uh, illness was, was childhood trauma. And that was uh, being sexually abused as a child uh, from, from about the age of eight or nine till about 14. Uh, and here I was working as a child protection social worker. Uh, and, and you always hear these words called transference and are you, you know, working your own issues to other people and, and all of this. And I always had this in my head, you know, and I, and I always knew the answer to that, which was no. Uh, but on the other hand, I think when we work in a caring profession, whether it be social work, nursing, doctors, does it's too, we do have to learn the academics of our work, absolutely. But we also have to learn the emotional connection, the empathetic connection, because there's healing in that for people. I know from working with people and I know from being on the receiving end of it, that is healing when a professional or a carer or a family member really gets you or can say, I, I get that, I understand that. And I, 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 I've never been able to say it within my work because, you know, it's, it's never been appropriate that I should. But I do know that, that my lived experience has certainly helped me to be a better social worker, to be a better... Uh, and it's only now that I feel comfortable in being able to even say that because I know that I'm kind of vulnerable in saying that because someone could come back to me and, and say, well, you're not or whatever. But I know in my heart that, 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 that it is. So I'm turning, I suppose, my mental health illness uh, into a, a very strong pillar of recovery, yes. both 
uh, for me, my relationship with my family, my relationship with my work, and, and my ability to, to be a better Gary, mm. a happier Gary, you know? Mm. Mm. Sorry, I know I go on a bit. <laughs> no, I, well, no, Gary, because to be honest, like, I think that gives people a really, a really clear sense of like initially when you described when you first went to the GP in Waterford Hospital like I think we could all get a sense of the fact that you were very clearly unwell at that point mm -hmm. but the fact that you've come to a side where you can literally recognize and integrate all of that that has happened I mean when you're describing the work that you do and the experience that you have I've no doubt that even without you saying it you're able to make people feel seen and heard in a way that perhaps others might not be able to because you really know it on the cellular level, which is really, really impactful. So thanks for sharing that. And, you know, I think that's, that's really a powerful thing for us to have to hold as we continue our conversation about that experience of weaving in your family into your recovery. And I'm just wondering in terms of the kind of the sort of building blocks of it, you know, would you have been asked at the outset, can you remember at the outset when you first went into hospital, would you have been asked at that point, what are we doing about your family and supporters here, Gary? Are we contacting them? Are we not? Are we telling them a little? Are we not? Like, What sort of arrangements were there around your consent at that time? Yeah, I think it's important to remember. Uh, uh, and it's something that, that, you know, I'm conscious of when we, when we're um, looking at development even within the hospital, that, uh, when a person comes in, they're very sick normally, they're acutely sick. Uh, and in my case, uh, you know, I was acutely sick. Um, and I know that we do go through all of that kind of questions and asking people then, uh, you know, about involvement. Uh, but you're not really, in, you don't really have capacity or the ability to really answer at that stage, you know. Mm. Uh, and what you might say is because you just want to get into that bed, pull the blanket over your head <laughs> and forget, the, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, so it, it, it may have been, but I, I certainly don't remember it. Uh, I do think that as time went on, I know that I certainly brought it up within the team saying that, you know, my, my children, we're anxious to sit down and talk about it. Uh, and there is, let's, let's face it, there is a resource issue around time uh, that doctors may have, you know, because, sure. uh, you know, they have, they have to try and see everybody at least once a week and, and, and the registrars are there and that, you know, everybody's busy. So I, I fully get it, you know, that it wasn't, it would have been better, nicer, I think, it was more of it, it was more time given to it. Uh, if there's more time to uh, allow questions to be asked uh, in the sense of, you know, because not all of us know exactly what we want to ask or how we need to ask it when we go into a meeting. It's only as the meeting evolves. And I think to allow the meeting to evolve where it's a discussion uh, mm. rather than a just one way conversation uh, takes up a bit of time. And maybe, you know, it, it's, Again, I'm going back to the idea that we have around uh, introducing the peer support who has the lived experience, because yeah. I think that they may be, I'm, I'm convinced that they will have an important role if we're able to get it up and running within St. Pat's, they will have an important role of being able to, uh, first of all, to be that link and maybe answer some of the questions that family members might have along with me as a service user, not instead mm. of me, but with me, uh, but also maybe in arranging and, and, and bringing awareness to the team that a family may need a bit more time than just the 10 minutes. Uh, mm. So, but the, it, is, it, is, it is hard. I do, I do, I, I recall, you know, feeling very much the frustration, I think, on behalf of my children, you know, yeah, of, not, of, of not feeling that they, they were getting enough information or understanding enough of it. Uh, they didn't just want to know what medication I was on. I suppose they were really, at the time, I wasn't living near them, which I am now. And I suppose their concern was, well, you know, how we know that that's going to be safe? You know, how, yeah, how do we know yeah. that he's not going to hurt himself? Uh, yeah. And that and that was really so. So it was hard 
it was hard. And I understand from the consultants and the teams balancing their time and resources is also hard. Uh, but it's a work in progress, I think, that maybe we, we should be and can be doing a little bit better, Jan. Mm. And it's one of, I think it's interesting listening to you talk about it and then thinking back to some of what Paul and Linda was mentioning as well. Just that idea that every case is different, every person is different, every family dynamic is different, every mental health presentation is different, and trying to kind of get a a sort of a, a workflow through that that's going to hold in every set of circumstances is really tricky because as you rightly say at the outset you're effectively in crisis and you're trying to manage that part of it and then as things move on like I'm interested you kind of alluded to it a little bit there earlier on like at what stage of recovery did you feel able to involve your family crucially now in a way that wasn't you trying to parent them but in a way that was letting them in to support you? When did that kind of junction happen? To me, that, that took, um, I think it was really on my last admission, which was February of uh, 21. Uh, and I realised, Jan, that, I, that I, I hadn't fully accepted that I had a, a mental health disability, that right. I had a mental health illness. Uh, and I... I I remember in my head saying, you know, really, you say that you've accepted it, but you haven't, Gary. You know, you don't really, you haven't. It's like uh, I, I have diabetes, you know, uh, and I thank God I was on stage two. And someone said to me, oh, you shouldn't be eating that ice cream. I'm oh, sure I don't really have diabetes. You know, th th that, that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, you know, you, but, but I remember then saying, hang on, Gary, you, you really, this is my word, my way of doing was I really need to make friends with this. I really need to make friends with my depression. And instead of me seeing it uh, as something out there or, or something external, I need to accept it, that this is me, that that depression is as much part of Gary Kiernan as, as any other part of me. Uh, and that it's, it's how I am. It's how I uh, function. It's how I think it's how I feel uh, and I really need to come out and accept that then because I had spoken to my kids before about it they obviously knew you know as medical but I from that moment on because I tried and I'm still trying always to make friends with it, it gave me the strength to be able to really talk about it okay to really, uh, um, I, I, was, I was at a function there a couple of weeks ago, uh, a family function. And uh, one of my children said, uh, you know, I said, look, I think I might head off. And she said, well, do you not want to hang around for whatever it was? Uh, and, and, and I remember thinking, of course, I, of course I do want to, mm. you know? And, I, and then I thought, Gary, why are you trying to get away? Or was it? And, and then the talk to me about it's not that I don't want to, maybe it's because I can't. Yeah. Maybe because I'm not feeling I can. Yeah. Uh, and then being able to, I suppose, explain that or understand it myself. Uh, and that brings me to something that within the family relationship and within friends and, you know, significant friends you might have and stuff like that. It's really hard to try and explain something that you don't really understand yourself. It's really hard. It's hard. It was hard for me to really explain what I was feeling. You know, it's easy to explain, well, depression is this and depression is that. For me, what was hard was to explain what I was feeling because I kind of knew what I was feeling, but a lot of the time I didn't, and I still probably don't know why. You know, and yeah, I didn't have yeah. to come away from things to think why. Or if I'm with people for the number of days, I would find that I need to come away from that. And it makes me a bit exhausted. So I, I have to accept that that's how my makeup is. You know, that's, yeah. that, that's, that's what it is. So it, it, it's, it's then I think that there's these almost, we talk about taking steps, you know, and that we're growing and we take steps. Uh, I think for me, it's more kind of like, you know, the, the, the circular stairs that we go up like the lighthouse, <laughs> that, that we feel like we're at the same place, 
but actually we are going that bit higher all the time. Yeah. Uh, instead of it being step by step, it is that kind of circular stairs, circular steps, mm -hmm. uh, because you you think I have that sussed and great now I'm able to talk to my family, and then then you realize something else come up. You say, well, hang on, maybe I need to be able to really understand this a bit more for myself. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's really ongoing. It really. Well, that's that it, comes it, across so clearly from what you're saying about the nature of building that trust at an early stage in recovery that you're all on the same page and you're in each other's corner and keeping the communication moving and what strikes me about the example you just mentioned is just that idea of being able to manage people's expectations like their expectations of you and your expectations of them in scenarios that may be difficult and kind of triggering so that you're not all putting yourselves in a situation where it's like oh what are we what are we doing here and yeah. equally like I was struck when you said that about the the sort of social engagement like we've all been at social engagements where there's maybe like you know a granny with a dodgy hip in the corner and everyone can see ah Jesus she's wrecked like she's wrecked she's sitting down there really she should go home but in your situation, it's not visible and everybody's looking around going, sure, isn't it great? It's a birthday or it's a wedding or it's a whatever. And this is brilliant. And nobody can actually visibly see the strain you're under to just maintain a presence yeah. there. It's I hard. It is. And, and I know we're probably pressed for time, but I just give, do you remember the uh, images we had through the COVID when we looked at our, our medical staff and they had the mask and they had the, the scars of the mask around our face? Mm. Remember, we were, we were all struck by, yeah. uh, by them. Uh, I remember thinking to myself that if, if we were able to see the scars of their work inside of the head, what would that look like? That this was a, for first, for, for a lot of us, this was the first physical sign of the effect of them working on a ward or what or the ambulance driver or whatever it was when we could see that you know uh, yeah. and yet i'm sure the effects of the work that's on the inside of them if we could see it would be so much more obvious as well would be so much more scarred mm. uh, so much more affected because um you know our our mental health, as you said, it's, it's something that isn't visible, isn't seen. Uh, and we don't see it when we look in the mirror either, maybe. Mm. Uh, but for me, it, it's certainly something that I kind of, I think I feel more than I see. And when I feel something, it's an emotion, it's a feeling. And for me to put words on that, whether it's to explain it to my doctor, to my carers, or to the people who love me most, my family, sometimes that that's hard, you know, that's hard to do. And I, and I suppose I, if I to leave one thing with maybe some carers who might be similar thoughts or situation, you know, uh, it's not that, for me, it's not that I didn't want to, it's not that I, 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 I wanted to, but I just didn't have the tools to do it. I didn't have the tools within me to get that uh, from my stomach, into the words that I could say to that person, mm. I love you and I'm sick and this is how I'm sick uh, yeah. at the moment. Or this is how, you know, um, I think it's going to take years <laughs> to be able to master that. And maybe we, I'll never master it. But, uh, but maybe the destination all... isn't mastering it. This is the thing, you see, our heads are always trying to look for the end point. Yeah. And I think it's interesting when you just describe there, and I think for any of the carers that are joining us this morning, it's getting comfortable with just being on the road, being yeah. on the road side by side with somebody and maybe not always getting the information. Because I can, I mean, I can so empathize. I would be the, the most fixer person, like, what can I do to fix this? What am I, and wanting to like, no, I need to be doing something and getting to a point of accepting. It's not about that. That's not what this is. No, and no. that can be really uncomfortable, I think, for people to arrive at a point where they're they don't feel like they're actively helping, but actually just their presence yeah. is a support. Uh, absolutely, and it's so important. Uh, I know certainly my medical team have been fantastic, but I tell you, medical team without supporters and carers, without family and friends, uh, we I would not be talking this way now, and I probably wouldn't be 
where I am now physically or mentally, I wouldn't be. Uh, and and uh, it's just so, so important. But I, 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 I empathize, it must be so hard for them. It must be so hard. And mm. I know it's hard for my family. I know it's, it's hard and, and it's so hard to, to know that you have a diagnosis or something that can be managed, but the times when it probably won't be managed. And, and my worry, you know, that a person would have about their loved one harming themselves or dying by suicide or doing any of those things. I can, I can only imagine the worry. And then for those carers to not feel that they have a way of communicating or uh, being part of the recovery, if for any reason, and there is lots of restrictions and some of them are good and some of them are red tape restrictions and that. But I suppose we just have to keep on working at them, don't we? We just have to keep yeah. on unraveling them and, and seeing what's the workaround. How can we work around this? You know, and uh, sometimes building people's understanding of why things are the way they are as well. Sometimes it's just not immediately obvious, particularly if you haven't been in a scenario before. Yeah. why something is the way it is yeah. so i can i can appreciate that that is that's challenging all right gary i'm conscious i could talk to you all day and i've completely blown the timings out of the water so they're going to love me and St. Pat's for that <laughs> but Blame will, me on it. If, if you can hang around <laughs> I got for, questions, <laughs> for questions at the end i'd really appreciate it because i'm sure no we'll have some coming in but listen thanks so much for being oh, so thanks. open and honest about your experience i've no doubt people will have found it really really helpful so thanks, thanks for that much. gary we'll chat to you in a bit it. Thank, thank you thank you all right siobhan you've been patiently standing by there um, so siobhan fitzharris is the service user engagement leader at st patrick's and we're going to talk now about why engagement with service users like gary and their supporters is so important hi siobhan hi john how are you <laughs> thanks um so we'll just kick into kick straight on because you know, as I say, I, I yeah. went a bit over there, but I just thought it was no good order. to give Gary the space. Absolutely. So if you want to kick on, I'll turn my video off and we'll watch your prayers. OK, um, just, there you go. Hope everybody can see that. OK. Um, as Jan said, my name is Siobhan Fitzharris. My role in St. Patrick's is as a service user engagement lead. And I want to talk to you really about um, engagement in the recovery um, process. And as Gary very clearly outlined in his talk um, recovery is not a straightforward linear process it is a, a, a dest it is a journey not a destination and um, one of the key concepts of recovery is that hope is possible and another key um, aspect of recovery is that um, it, it, people have the right to be involved in their own care and treatment as we've outlined um, and much more autonomy is, is uh, allocated to treatment now than there was um, in previous in, in history I suppose um, traditionally and, and thankfully no it's no longer the, the case that people would have been committed to an institution they didn't come out again when they had a mental health uh, issue or illness and they didn't have a voice, they didn't, they weren't included, they didn't have somebody speaking for them. So the change that has come about in recent times puts much more emphasis on hope of recovery and also on partnership and communication. And that's what we mean when we're talking about engagement is having people who use a service and those who support them much more involved in that service and how it works and how it functions and involved in the design and the steering and the management of, the, of that service. And that's what we mean when we're talking about uh, engagement in this context. And the reason why engagement is so important is that whether as a service user or as a family member or who is somebody supporting somebody who is a service user, you have a wealth of information and experience that is really valuable that we can tap into to help improve the service and make it the best that it can be. You are experts by experience and that that's something that is very important in the recovery process and the recovery model of treatment that includes the views of those who use the service and those who support them. And the way that engagement works is that uh, we create mechanisms and, and processes that enable service users and those who support them to be able to input into the planning, development and implementation of our services, all of which help us to improve. 
So we've established some um, engagement groups. Um, as Gary mentioned earlier, he is um, the chair of our Service User and Supporters Council. Um, we have advisory groups, which um, our service user advisory uh, network, which we call SUN, and our newly formed family care and supporters advisory network. So the purpose of the, of the uh, SUAS, the Service User and Supporters Council, is to make sure that the views of service users and those who support them are represented. They provide views on proposed changes, so management would ask them to review things that are, are being suggested or things that they are looking at changing that will impact um, the experience of service users and their families, and they provide their views on that, and they also make suggestions uh, as how to improve services from their own experience. And as Gary alluded to, one of the, the recent suggestions they made um, to the clinical team recently was the introduction of peer support workers into St. Patrick's and they're working on a proposal that has been very welcomed by the clinical team um, for, to, to make this introduction to um, this role on a pilot basis and see how, uh, how it works out. It's something that um, peer support workers have been integrated into um, clinical teams much more in the UK and I have recently in, in uh, the HSC teams. And it's something that St. Patrick's are looking to do based on a suggestion made by uh, SUAS. And some of the other practical ways in which um, SUAS members are involved is they would sit on interview panels, particularly for clinical roles, key clinical roles, to make sure that the service user perspective is included at, at the time of appointment. They would also review feedback that's provided anonymously through our surveys from service users so that they get to see um, service users experience and they can hone in on different um, trends or patterns that of, of um, feedback and how that's reflecting the experiences of service users. They take part in campaigns, for example, um, we, our current campaign is No Stigma, uh, which is a reimagining a world where stigma didn't exist. And Gary took part in the media launch of that and um, took part in some media interviews, which led to a meeting with um, Minister um, for Mental Health and Older People, Mary Butler, TD, and um, uh, Minister Butler then attended um, a SUAS meeting based on that um, meeting that uh, Gary had had with her. And she was very impressed by SUAS and what it does and, and how it works and functions. And then we have other members who, who don't want to get involved in things um, publicly like um, media campaigns, but they write things like blog articles that get shared on our website and they write from their own perspective of a service user um, to highlight different aspects of their own recovery uh, journey that are very useful to other people then who can um, relate to, to their uh, journey. Another uh, project that SUAS took on was during um, the COVID lockdown uh, periods, they were aware that their own support networks weren't available to them um, the way they would have been previously, and that they were aware of isolation um, among them, their own group and themselves, um, so they developed an online peer support service. And while this was fully supported by St. Patrick's, it was fully run uh, for and by service users. St. Patrick's provided the funding, for example, to uh, enable the volunteer peer facilitators to be trained so that they were fully equipped to be able to run the service. But the, the, the service was run by and for service users. And then as lockdown reduced um, and society started to reopen again, uh, the demand for that service uh, declined, which they saw as a positive as people were out and about and able to access their own uh, support networks again. And uh, if should there ever be a need to um, re-establish a peer support service like this, uh, hopefully not because of the pandemic or, or lockdown situations, um, but the blueprint is there and it could be reactivated as, if demand required for it. Another thing that uh, SUAS members would do is that based on service user feedback, we heard from service users who were near discharge dates. They were finding that they were feeling anxious about leaving hospital, especially if they'd been in hospital for a long time. And we asked what they, what they felt would help. And they said to hear from other service users who had been there and done that before them and who had made that transition to hear from their, their own uh, stories. So we establish a panel of service users who take part in these sessions. They're very informal, non-clinical um, sessions. 
and um, they run twice a month and they've been recently incorporated into the Pillars of Wellness program and that's working very well um, and it, it provides an opportunity for more service users to be able to um, attend these sessions um, when they, they, they feel that they need to. Then the other group I mentioned is our service user advisory network, which we call SOON. And unlike SUS, this isn't a formal committee. Um, when people join it, it's um, effectively a mailing list. And then I would send out information about different um, opportunities to get involved and people can choose to get involved in the way that it's of interest to them, whether that's joining a project group or a consultative forum um, or completing a survey. It's very easy to join. Um, there's a sign up form on our uh, website and the link is there. And uh, I'll show you more where all these um, pages are on the website. Um, and as I mentioned, members can attend things like consultative forums. And these are um, open discussions where a topic is presented for discussion and then um, members who attend are able to share their views on that particular topic. Uh, we aim to hold about three of those a year. Um, most recently, we held one uh, with current inpatients and um, recently discharged inpatients about their in inpatient dining experience because some of the feedback was showing that um, the, the, the satisfaction levels were declining slightly on that. So we wanted to know more about it. So we held a, a forum and the people took part in that, which was very helpful. And the catering team got some good feedback and um, some suggestions and which are being implemented um, now. And um, they usually are attended by representatives of the Board of Governors and members of the senior management team. And they find it very helpful to be able to hear feedback firsthand rather than a summary of feedback presented in a report. So th this is a format that's working very well uh, as a way to increase the opportunity for people to provide feedback. Another group that we um, established from members of SUAS and SOON is a working group that work with our uh, digital health team around improving remote care um, as everything changed so suddenly during the periods of lockdown um, we adapted to, to using a, a remote uh, services and uh, the digital health team are working with a group of service users who take part in this forum on a, me a monthly basis um, to help improve communication, which is, uh, has um, really helped to how we communicate to service users and staff about using remote care um, services. And also the forum helps the team to prioritize areas for development um, specifically around um, rollout of your portal, which is, it, it, it allows people to, enables people, I should say, to access their electronic health record from the time they register going forward. It's not retrospective, but it, it builds up going forward. And um, the, the next phase of that has been really in, um, informed by our service user group um, and more functionality is coming available through your portal based on the feedback from this group. And you don't have to join groups to be able to take part. Um, we, we ask people to, for, um, for feedback through our surveys after they've been discharged from hospital or home care or after attending an outpatient um, appointment or completing a day program. And we also have a system of comment cards and these are available digitally or they're available in paper format in the hospital or from the information center uh, on the ground floor of St. Patrick's University Hospital. And this enables visitors, uh, service users, staff members to be able to provide um, comments about things they think are working well. Yes, please, we want more of that, or that's not working well, or this needs to change. And um, you can complete them anonymously, or if you want an action taken and, and a follow-up um, take action um, followed through, then you will complete them with your contact information. So these are other ways that people can uh, provide feedback and get um, and input. But as you've seen, some of the, the outcomes that have come about from the involvement and engagement um, are based on service users' experience and service users' suggestions. And the missing piece in this is that family members, carers and supporters aren't being represented um, across these groups. For example, SUIS is called the Service User and Supporters uh, Council, but we don't actually have any family members, carers or supporters as members. And that's something that we'd really like to um, rectify. And um, we really would like people to consider joining um, SUAS 
And we also then set up a, a family carers and supporters uh, advisory network, which is the, the family members version of our um, SUIN network. So without having the, the level of involvement or commitment that's required from joining a, a council or a formal committee, um, you can be invited to take part in different um, uh, projects as they come up that are relevant um, to, to your own levels of interest. But that's not to say that there hasn't been anything that's done to um, help and inform um, carers and supporters. SUIS developed a care and support and information guide. They originally did that back in 2015. And then as so much had changed recently, um, they up, revised and updated it last year. And it's available as a, a digital download on the St. Patrick's.ie website. And they wrote this because um, they felt it, there was a gap in information to um, provide family members with information about how to support a, a service user. And it's written from a service user perspective. There's a lot of practical information about that, about in that as well, um, about how the hospital works and functions and the different um, things that are, happen within the hospital and how it functions. So if you haven't been made aware of it already, um, you might be interested in downloading the, the guide and it's also available in uh, paper format in the information centre in um, St. Patrick's University Hospital. We, we are looking for um, family members to join the Academic uh, Institute Steering Group. Um, this is a new group. Um, the Empowering Recovery Mental Health Academic Institute has been um, developed that will help advance the role of teaching and education. And they, what they're looking for is a steering group that's made up of um, service users and they don't have to be specifically from St. Patrick's Mental Health Services, uh, but people who have experience of um, attending a mental health service and people who have experience of, of supporting people who have attended a mental health service. And what they want to do is make sure that the agenda, the research agenda is focused on recovery, that it's, it's, um, it's informed by service users and those who support them rather than academics and clinicians. So we've had a lot of interest in, um, in joining the steering group from service users, but we would really value um, some more um, interest from people who are family members, carers or supporters who are interested in joining the steering group which will make it a much more rounder um, representation of, of our, um, our, our interest groups. So if you want to know more about anything I've just said, this is a, a, an image of the St. Patrick's.ie website and if you go to the get involved section which is highlighted there on the main navigation, That'll bring you into two pages. There's one for SUIS and one for SUIN that will tell you information about the groups and how to join them. And then also in the getting help section on the main navigation, um, if you go into that and then go to the carers and supporters page, that has information about um, the family education series there on the, you'll see on the sidebar um, that Linda was talking about. There's the downloadable care and, and supporters information guide that's available there. And down at the end of that sidebar, you'll see there's a link there to information about joining the family cares and supporters advisory group. And also and that page will have information about joining the Academic Institute steering group. And if you'd like to know any more about um, anything I've said or about getting involved in any of these groups, you can email me as um, at, at patsmail.com and we can arrange to have a chat and, and talk more about it. I hope this was of interest. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Siobhan. That was so, it's just so great to see so many different avenues available to people to feed back into the organisation, which is brilliant because we've talked so much about things evolving and things happening on a continuum and things being on a case by case basis. So it's good to see that the, the feedback routes map that as well and encourage that as well to feed into that process. That's brilliant. Now, the link also to that carers and supporters information guide that you mentioned there, we're going to share that now in either the chat or the Q&A box. So any of you here with us can can um, visit it via that link either. Now I'm just going to invite Linda and Gary back into the conversation now and while they're turning on their uh, videos I'm just going to thank all of today's speakers for I think it was a really interesting discussion and thanks to all of you for sticking with us given that I've totally blown the time frame so thanks I can see you're all still there so thanks for that and for submitting some great questions which was really 
really useful to us as well. We're just going to have a quick, I'm, it's not going to be like a rapid fire buzzer round type question situation, but we're just going to have a quick few questions and then, then we'll wrap up. One question that had come in earlier, Linda, I'm just going to put to you if that's okay, uh, from David. And it had got to do with um, what we were chatting about earlier with Professor Fear, and it just came in just as he was as he was leaving. And David was wondering if, as a parent, he passes on information to the team about a family member, because obviously Professor Fear was saying information can come in, but it doesn't necessarily come out if the consent isn't there. How will that information be used? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I suppose it, it can depend very much on the person. So if David's parents to someone under the age of 18, it is kind of a different parameter we'd be working with and, and they'd be making that very clear on Willow Grove as well. And there would be a lot more constant communication as will be necessary when we're, when we're working with people that are kind of under the, the adult age. But let's imagine that that person is a wee bit older and it, this is like a, an adult child uh, that they're referring to. Um, so it depends really and we would navigate that with the person so we would ask them do you are you comfortable with us sharing this information back with your loved one would that be helpful uh, it might depend on some of the information as well because I would say nine times out of ten it might be for example if it's an addiction that there's a concern around relapse or if it's in mental health it might be you know we just want to make sure that you've uh, a fuller picture so it might be like a sliding scale in lots of ways so it might just give us a bit more context perhaps the person isn't quite there to open up and tell us all that and, and to be fair you know they might be only there with us a week or two or three weeks and, and we wouldn't expect them to be you know straight away telling like because we are as much as we're trying to be professionals we're, we're, we appreciate that we're strangers and people in life and how we work up and build that relationship uh, and try and make sure that they have trust and communicate with that with us so uh, we probably negotiate with that with the person when they are calling with us what the information is and the only time we would have to break that confidentiality if there's kind of risk safeguarding like if we're getting into the territory that someone could be at risk of harm but we would definitely name that with the person there and then they wouldn't okay. be walking away from a phone call wondering what's going to happen with this information yes so i understand yeah. there and then good yeah um i'm just conscious Anne marie in the comments was sort of saying that she was fully agreeing with you Gary and Siobhan around this idea of peer support workers in the unit and you know people with lived experience that it really gives a different but similar perspective and does provide support but then somebody else was asking which is a, an important question to ask as well what kind of boundaries are in place for people being involved in peer-to-peer -peer? because obviously in some instances if you're early on enough in your recovery like being that invested in something you know, it could potentially cause a relapse in you, worst case scenario, or it could just impact your recovery in some way. So, yeah, I just wonder, Siobhan, you know, are there appropriate boundaries in place and how that dynamic is managed to ensure everybody's well-being? Yeah. Yeah, and it's, a, it's a valid point. Um, the, the role of peer support workers has clear um, defined um, parameters around it. And anybody who is Work, looking to work in that field has to complete um, required training and they also have to be at a certain stage in their own recovery where they are well um, and obviously as we said recovery isn't a, a straight line process so that at some stages maybe relapse can happen so there there has to be supports built into that role where um that people can uh, reflect on, on the, the impact of the role on their own mental health and, and take a step back if, if that's what's required. But there is a lot of guidance and a lot of research has been done on um, how best to support peer support workers. Um, and because they are sharing their own experience with people that can take a toll on, on them. So it has to be very carefully uh, managed and, and the training I think is very helpful in, in helping them to put some uh, boundaries around that to protect their own um, mental health and well-being. Yeah, and nobody is doing this 40 hours a week. Yeah. You know, it's a very managed kind of, as you, as you say. Gary, would you have, what is your experience of that as somebody who does share your experience and literally yeah. living the role of peer support? 
Yeah, like Siobhan said there, you know, it is very important. Uh, it's very important that it's a very structured role within the hospital or within any service. Uh, and the proposal that we're making is that it would be very structured with a clear referral process within the hospital, you know, so they would be seen as professionals with a lived experience. That's the role of peer support. And there would be a referral system to, to, to uh, ask them to come in, et cetera. Uh, we have already, the HSE have rolled this out and we're lucky that they've also done an evaluation and they also have what we call a kind of standard business process. So, you know, the nuts and bolts of how it would work, how it would mm -hmm. safeguard them, how it would safeguard the service users and that. So that's something that we have to build on. Uh, but like any new service, it is innovative as well. Uh, and we, I'm sure we won't get it right, but we certainly have to have the structures in it so as that it is safe that it functions safely and that it's seen as very much as part of the team, not just as a, a do good or kind of role. And it won't be seen as that within the hospital. So that's, mm -hmm. what we, that's what we're building on. That's what the proposal is. But I think going back to what Siobhan was saying about service, service and supporters, if they could join the council, because this is the voice that we need to hear. We need yeah. to hear, you know, from the perspective of a carer and that because I don't, you know, ha have that. Uh, and and so if we could get some carers on it would be fantastic uh, because we I know that uh, the vice and the angle that they see and experience things that would be so helpful to the likes yeah. of this. Mm. Well, just to say on that, that if you are interested, just to reiterate what Siobhan mentioned there, if you are interested in getting involved, you can go to the website, which is stpatricks.ie, and it's forward slash get hyphen involved. If you can't find it across the top, just type in get hyphen involved and it'll bring you there. And equally, um, you know, people who are interested in joining the Family Carers and support, Supporters Advisory Network or the Academic Institute Steering Group can also contact Siobhan. So Siobhan is sfitzharris at stpatsmail.com and you can find out more there on the news page at um, stpatricks.ie and there's, we'll put those links in the, in the question box. So really, like, we have to wrap up and I just want to say thanks to everybody for being so generous with their information and their experience and answering questions and for all of you for providing questions and really sparking interesting sort of side roads to go down in terms of the conversation. And just to let you know that there are two further webinars for carers and supporters as part of this year's Recovery Festival programme. You can register for either of those on the events page at stpatricks.ie. The first one is tomorrow at 12.30 and it explores family therapy and an event on Friday looks at caring for young carers and that's taking place at 10.30. Also, I mean, feedback has nearly been a theme of the whole morning. We really like your feedback on this actual event and on any events that you attend because that just helps design better events into the future and events that you'll find more relevant and, and even more useful. So a link will pop up on the screen when the event closes and you can click through to that and fill it out. And really just the last thing I wanted to say was, you know, thanks for coming. And for any of you that are with us this morning that are supporting somebody during a difficult time, take care. Like I've no doubt your loved ones are so grateful for your support, even if they're not in a place where they can express it at this point in time. I know they are grateful for it. So please mind yourself. Thanks again for joining us this morning. And I really hope you found it useful. And thanks to Siobhan, Gary and Linda and Professor Freerin. So take Thank care. You. Enjoy the rest of your good day. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.